John, this week, Tucker Carlson, former Fox News anchor, who now has one of the biggest, I think, conservative podcasts in the country, interviewed um, a guy I'd never heard of before, Daryl Cooper. He's a historian. They talked uh, at length about World War II, and he made some really, really fascinating, which is a light way of putting it, comments. He you know, suggested that, for example, Winston Churchill was kind of a bad actor in World War II. Um, he made some, he assigned Hitler some sort of pragmatic problem solving, you know, motives with regards to the death camps. It was really kind of hard to follow. So what exactly happened here? Is this a scandal that's worth uh, talking about? Well, almost, I mean, it's not like the guy said things that were new. The difference is he said them on Tucker Carlson's program, which sure. obviously has a bigger audience than most of the major news networks. And it's, it's, it's just, it was just crazy. It was, it, it was uh, just fascinating, if not so <laughs> big that, that, that he would be platformed. And Tucker Carlson actually went on to endorse him as a historian, like least well-known, but one of the most honest. And, you know, I look, we don't have time to really get into the ins and outs of what he claimed, but the big part of it was that Churchill was the real villain of the Second World War and that Adolf Hitler was really put into a corner um, and that he wanted peace over and over and over again. And, and Churchill kept pushing him and pushing him and pushing him. And that includes kind of, you know, ending in this position where they had no choice but to deal with all the POWs by launching this thing called the Holocaust. Now, to be clear, the guy did turn around and say, you know, Hitler's not blameless and he, is guilty and all that sort of stuff. But it was a way of justifying uh, some of the worst atrocities. And then on a Twitter thread afterwards, he kind of doubled down on those claims. I mean, it was just really something. Now, what is there to say? Um, the specifics on this are not historically up in the air um, of the evil that was done uh, by the Nazis, the Third Reich, led by Adolf Hitler who had written about what he wanted to do and continuously talked about what he wanted to do and then did what he said he wanted to do over and over and over. Like that, 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 that stuff is not uh, up, up for grabs. The fact that Hitler made certain promises and, and overtures of peace that he didn't mean and then turned around and undermined it, that stuff's all historically verifiable. So the, the, the selective use of data to prove the thesis is, 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 is troubling. The fact that it was done on such a, a big outlet is is even more troubling. And that points to something that we were talking about this in the editorial meeting and, and, and Tim and, and Shane, two of our colleagues, I think that we're really kind of wrestling with this well. Just this um, th th this kind of conspiratorial, somebody's hiding something from me and there's a way to get behind the narrative, you know. And the problem with that is, is the fact that there's so much truth to the to this dominant narrative that's always being given to us and sold to us, and it creates this again crisis of trust. But what ends up happening then is anybody who promises you the inside scoop suddenly becomes a reliable source, even if they're not. And and that's really what happened here. It was just really, you know, again, nothing this guy said was actually kind of new, but it just just widely, you know, not 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 credited. Uh, now look. Was Churchill a perfect figure? No, and he certainly wasn't. And he pushed back on those details, looking at certain ways that Churchill was morally, uh, you know, uh, guilty of different things as the explanation that Churchill's actually the villain of the entire story. And again, um, you know, not, not, not the case. So, uh, the specifics of this, I think, are pretty thoroughly have been th pretty thoroughly studied and adjudicated and so on. And, but I think we need to be careful in our, um, in this m the moment where there's a crisis of trust to become so cynical that anybody that promises us the inside scoop suddenly becomes a trustworthy source. Mm. It's just, it's just really, you know, not, not the case. And I think also there was a part of this that made me think of our conversation last week, the conversation about ideology versus worldview, Right. And that when you kind of superimpose an ideology and an ideology tends to divide people who believe in the ideology are good, people who don't as bad, we're the good ones, they're the bad ones. You know, th th that's one of the features of ideology rather than kind of what's true about the human condition to break the world up into the ones who are the problems and ones who are the good guys. And then all the data has to be reinterpreted. And 
we're seeing that in the way uh, both ideologues on all sides, and I mean the far left and the far right, are talking about historical facts. And this is an example of that this week. So it was troubling. I honestly wouldn't spend a whole lot of time, you know, talking about this normally if it wasn't so loud, even today on social media. It's kind of like the headline here. And, you know, for everyone to know in case anything crazy happens the next two days, we're having this conversation on Wednesday, which is a little bit earlier than normal. But I, I, I think it is an example of that kind of the difference between ideology and, and worldview, another way of drawing that distinction. Here's a good one. Just pulling the whole conversation we've had today together. Should denying the Holocaust, now I, that's not what this person was doing, but should denying the Holocaust be illegal? Because it is illegal in, I think, Germany and Poland. It might be illegal in France. So should it be? Is that a good thing? You've got, yeah. what, 30 seconds. Let's hear it. <laughs> yeah, in 30 seconds, let me address that one. I, I mean, look, there is um, limits to freedoms. You can't yell fire in a crowded theater is the famous example. Why? Because of these ideas and, and the harm that they create. It gets it, it gets more difficult when it's harder to tabulate the immediate harm factor. And I think, you know, when you're coming out of World War II, the danger and the harm of denying the Holocaust is immediate and obvious and clear. Should it be protected in that sense uh, as being irrefutable? Absolutely not. Like, you know, and that's the other thing is sometimes the way we think about speech and our misunderstanding of freedom is that you can't actually refute it. Um, free speech means you can say it and then, then it's fair game and people can beat it up. And um, and I do think that by and large, if we're looking to the state to be the arbiter of what's true Again, the state's job is to protect the rights, not to not, and, and to guarantee the rights, not to make the rights. They're not the source of the rights, and um, and I think that it we need to keep this space created for absolute refutation. That's what's so crazy um, about so many of the compromises of of speech in the West, in America in particular, that you're just not allowed to say, "Oh, this is actually wrong." You know what? Boys don't menstruate. You know, and suddenly you're you're accused of hate. No, we can actually have this as a scientific debate. It's crazy that we have to do it. It says a lot to, about right. the sort of world we live in that we're actually having this conversation. But we need to have this conversation. Yeah. Uh, and so I think that's the context. Uh, of it. Mm. I like it. <laughs> 